Good morning. It is so good to have you with us this morning as we continue in our study in the book of Acts. Today, we're going to be looking at the second half of Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 16. So if you got your Bible handy, if you would be turning to Acts 17, verse 16, we'll be starting there in just a few moments. But uh, first, we want to begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we praise your holy name. Lord, we thank you for all of the help that's been coming to uh, people in our country, in the southeastern section of our country, for help with the first hurricane that hit our, our nation uh, just a few days ago. Uh, Lord, we still re lift up those people to in prayer to you. We ask, Lord, that you would be with them, that you would help them, uh, that you would bring aid to them, Lord, and comfort to them in the cases where they've lost, lost loved ones and the cases where they've lost valuable property and, and possessions. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would be with them uh, as they as they recover uh, and get their lives back together. Lord, now as we've been hit by a second hurricane, we ask, Lord, that your people would gather together again and move on south into Florida to be with that those people at this time and to help them. Lord, we ask that you would gu guide them and, and help them to find those who are, are lost, uh, that can't be found. Uh, Lord, that you would allow them to comfort those who need comforting. Uh, Lord, uh, we ask that you would be with those who seek you and seek to find help at this time. Lord, we know that you are always there for those who seek you. And Lord, we we take that, that call to heart as we open your word today. Lord, help us to be ready to come to those who are seeking you as we find in our lesson today. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. During Paul's second missionary journey, Paul was driven out of Berea by hostile by hostile Jews from that had come from Thessalonica. Berea's right here. Thessalonica was just down the road. Thessalonica was a a much larger city uh, with a a much larger Jewish population. Uh, these Jews who did not listened to the gospel and were bitter towards the gospel, came against the people in Berea who were very receptive to the gospel message and uh, and they wanted to uh, they wanted to take Paul prisoner and take uh, take a, avenge what Paul had done in bringing the gospel to the Jews. And so Paul fled to Athens, all the way to Athens. So as we come from Berea on the map, they, they, he, they came to the coast, and they boarded a ship, and they sailed all the way down the coastline of Greece. As I'm showing you here on the map, around and, and around and around and again to the city of Athens right here. And Silas and Timothy would rejoin Paul there in a in a few week, weeks, uh, along with Luke and uh, some unnamed Bereans that had come with Paul in the first place. Uh, Timothy would later be sent by Paul to minister to the church at Thessalonica a few to to help them uh, get continue, which they do, as we see in the letter to Thessalonica, he, he mentions the help that Timothy brings to them um, for over 500 years. Athens had been one, had been the intellectual and cultural, one of the intellectual and cultural centers of the Western world. Athens was home to ancient philosophers like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. 
Other popular Greek philosophers like Zeno and Epicurus taught extensively in Athens. In Paul's day, the most renowned university in the civilized world was located in Athens. Now, let's go to verse 16 in chapter 17. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. Now, Paul observed that Athens was full of idols. This provoked a strong spiritual and emotional reaction in Paul's heart. Paul was troubled, as, as it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible. Paul saw compelling evidence that most Athenians were lost and doomed to a Christless eternity in their following and their belief in these idols that were all over Athens. Paul would not just accept this as the fate of all of those who lived in this great city of Athens. Paul was always prepared to speak out for Christ. And as he went about in the city, continually looked for opportunities to dialogue with individuals about Jesus. But in a society that did not know about the one and only living God of the universe, he would have begun by introducing them to Yahweh Elohim, the Lord and Almighty God revealed to mankind in the scriptures. Let's come down now to verses 17 and 18. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Now, Paul saw a city full of various philosophies and religions, along with high degrees of immorality being openly practiced within this society. Athens and the required number, uh, I'm sorry, Athens had the required number of Jewish men to establish, as we see here, in verse 17, a synagogue. So Paul went to the synagogue where he was reasoning with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. Now, Paul likely encountered various philosophies and beliefs as he shopped in the marketplace. One of the groups he encountered there were Epicurean and Stoic philosophers whom called who called Paul a babbler or a pseudo-intellectual. What, what they meant by that was that he was an amateur philosopher considering himself to be an intellectual. The literal Greek words used by them meant to pick up seed or one who feigns to be someone well-educated in philosophy. Now, let's take a little closer look at these two groups of so-called intellectuals. Epicureans, excuse me, close these back up again. My cat's trying to help me out. You have a hard time seeing me that way, that background. The, the, the Epicureans originated as followers of, of Epicurus in the 4th century B.C., around the time when the Greek Empire was expanding and just beginning 
to expose the Eastern world to Western philosophies. They believe the gods, quote, gods, plural, were unconcerned about humanity. They believed that when people died, they ceased to exist. Now, this is the Epicureans. Some of the other cults did not believe that way, but the Epicureans believed that when people died, they ceased to exist. They believed that the chief goal in life was therefore to avoid pain and to enjoy as much pleasure as possible. Their credo was eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The other group that we see mentioned here are Stoics. They originated with a philosopher named Zeno, who came along a little bit later in the late 4th and early 3rd century BC, around the time that the Greek empire of Alexander the Great was expanding to its greatest extent, and his philosophies and dictates were beginning to impact not only the Western world, but also the Eastern world of his empire. Stoics believed an impersonal divine reason produced all things and that all is eventually absorbed into that, re that reason. Now, this philosophy was the beginnings of a growing philosophy that will eventually develop into evolutionary theory along about the time of Aristotle, okay? They believed that the chief goal in life was to master self and to arrive at a point where neither pain nor pleasure matters. You can look past pain, you can look past pleasure, and you can be stoic in, the, in your attitude toward life, forgetting about what can happen as a result of the pain that comes in life. Okay, let's come down to verse 19. And they took... Paul, and they brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming, okay? The Areopagus is a mountain that stood about 400 feet overlooking Athens, the city of Athens, and commanded a view of the marketplace where Paul was speaking to people, okay? It was backed up by the Acro Acropolis, which is another higher mountain that sat behind the Areopagus. The Acropolis's name was derived from Ares or Mars, which is the Roman or Greek war of God of war, okay? But Paul, by Paul's day, the term referred to both geographic land, the geographic landmark, and to the judicial body of Athens, which ruled from Acropolis. Okay. Now, note that Paul did not appear as accused of doing anything criminal on this day but was merely asked to explain his teaching. If he was, if he was, if anything criminal was suspected by this discussion, then they would take him up the mountain to the Acropolis to be prosecuted. Okay. Note that Paul did not 
a, they brought Paul to the Areopagus at this time for what we're going to talk about today to debate his new philosophy with all their educated cronies. They labeled Paul as a proclaimer of strange deities. They were especially interested in Paul's claims about the resurrection of Jesus and believers in him from the dead. Let's come down to verses 20 and 21. They said, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. The Areopagus is the place where the well-respected intellectuals of Athens met every day to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. They were somewhat tolerant and interested in dissenting philosophies. Paul was not charged with a crime. They just intended to either understand Paul's philosophy or expose his arguments as without logic and himself as an intellectual imposter. These Greek philosophers were, however, the ones on trial. They would be judged by the holy God as worthy or unworthy of resurrection to eternal life according to how they each personally responded to what they were about to hear about the Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul knew what Jesus had told a Pharisee named Nicodemus, who had wanted to philosophize about gaining eternal life. Nicodemus had heard Jesus say these things that Paul had been saying, and he wanted to philosophize, so he caught Jesus at night, where the rest of his Pharisee friends couldn't hear this conversation going on. And Jesus responded to Nicodemus in a way that Nicodemus never expected. Jesus said, He who believes in me is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The one true living God is jealous for every person's love and devotion. And Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth paying the price for every person's sins with his own sacrificial death on the cross. Then, with his resurrection from the dead, Jesus thereby claimed for every person who has ever lived on this earth, before or since, to be the only pathway to put their sins away and come to the holy God. But Paul knew from observation and God's law, that the Athenians were in the same boat as Nicodemus. In Exodus 20, 3 through 6, Paul knew these words from the law. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or a likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children 
on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Paul knew these Athenians by his tour through Athens. He knew these Athenians were far beyond finding a human philosophy which was going to save them. And he proceeds to speak to them in terms that would explain to them their problem in a way that they would understand it. So Paul prayed and God spoke through Paul. Let's come down to verses 22 through 23. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all, at all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, their idols, I also found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. These two verses introduce the main theme of this section of Paul's discourse with the philosophers of Athens, the ignorance of pagan worship. The Greek wording leaves New Testament commentators a little divided over whether we should take verse 22 as Paul's affirmation that they were very religious in their interest, or whether he was simply stating that they were very superstitious people. If Paul was expressing his disdain for the number of idols he observed in the city, then this statement may have been intentionally ambiguous in order to arouse his audience's interest. Paul recounted his trip through the city where he observed their objects of their worship. Notice, note that Paul spoke of what objects they worshiped, not who they worshiped. Along with the many idols that depicted various Greek gods, Paul encountered an altar with this inscription to an unknown god. The Athenians wanted to make sure they had all their bases covered and they did not want to offend any other god or persons who might worship that particular god that they hadn't thought about. Paul states the fact that to worship an unknown god was to admit one's ignorance. In our day, in the U.S., Christians may often find ourselves witnessing to someone who does not believe in God and may not even have heard of God or the actual gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 22. When that happens, we need to inquire about what they believe, but we need to do it with gentleness and respect as we find in 1 Peter 3.15. In verse 23, as we see in Romans 1.14, Paul tells us, remember that every person knows intuitively that there is a supreme being. They may not want to admit it, but they place their trust or their belief in something that is over and above them. Look at these indicators of special need in a person's life. A search for meaning in life. Questions about truth that is in reality. A desire for personal worth and friendship. Personal needs in their life, like 
food, shelter, and et cetera, et cetera, and how they can find help in, in securing those. A sense of personal helplessness, a fear of their own mortality. The Athenians did not know the Lord, but this gave Paul the transition he needed to move the Athenians toward a knowledge of the one true living God. Paul said, what you worship in ignorance, I proclaim to you. Let's come down to verses 24 through 25. Paul said, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. It's notable that Paul begins with God as creator. He could be begun talking about one of an infinite a number of great things that God has done, but he begins there with God as creator. For the Greeks, around 450 years earlier, one of their most well-respected philosophers, a man named Plato, P-L-A-T-O, had written that his, that his studies of the physics of the world, the workings of the world, had convinced him that they could only be this complex and work to this extreme level of perfection only if there was a supreme being with an infinitely capable mind who had created all of these things. For us today, scientific discoveries of the 20th and 21st centuries have given irrefutable proof of an intelligent design by a supreme being designer of the universe and all living things within it. The term cosmos is familiar to every Greek. For the Greek in the first century, divinity was found in the heavens and in humanity. Two logical conclusions flow from the truth that God is the creator. Number one, God does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor does he need anything for man. Number two, God is Lord of heaven and earth, i.e. God is almighty, the one and only creator. The reality that God does not live in temples made by human hands is most often acceptable today by unbelievers within any basic theological precept. The Bible states that in his fullness, God is spirit, that he is omnipresent. He's everywhere in the universe. In other words, God is the source of all life. God himself gives to all people life and breath and all things that we need to live, the reference to nor is he served by human hands is a reference to the idols the pagans have created by human hands and then worship the idols and not God. God is self-sufficient. He does not need anything from any one of his creatures to fulfill himself. 
Greeks would have agreed with Paul's description of God to a point. They would have seen divinity as totally self-sufficient. They would have agreed that a divine being was the giver of life and breath, but the Greeks' pantheistic view of God is totally different from Paul's monotheistic view. Pantheism means all is God. The Greeks did not believe the world's existence to be separated from God's existence. God is the creator who stands above his creation and gives it life and meaning. But they believed that there were a whole host of gods that were involved in this creation. God made mankind in his own image. Singular. Genesis 1.27. This makes every human creature value and depend upon an account to the one true living God. Let me say that again. This gives every human creature value and makes that creature dependent upon and accountable to the one true living God. Let's go to verse 26. Paul goes on. He says, and God made from one, this, this one God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation okay the reference to one man is likely a reference to adam that we find named and described and his life described in the book of Genesis, the first man that God created. Although there are many nations, they are one in their common ancestry and thus are equally accountable to their creator. The Greeks believed they were superior to all nations and called the others by the Greek word barbarians. In Matthew 7, 7 through 8, God's son Jesus tells us that his father made humanity dependent upon him so that we might seek God in every matter of life. Every matter of every matter of life. God determined their appointed times. What happened in every single one of these people's lifetime and the boundaries of their habitation, where they lived, where they moved to, what they did in their lives. God can be known because he has revealed himself to us in all of these ways. Now let's come down to verse 27. Paul went on to say that they, meaning all of humanity that God created, would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. Now, grope is a picture of trying to find something in pitch darkness. Some place where you can't see your hands in front of your face. You close your eyes, you put your hands here, and you can't see your fingers. Okay? You, you look out into that darkness and you 
grope for something in the darkness. Okay, that's the picture here. That's what the Greek wording means, is that if they would, Paul says that they would, God wants them that they would seek him if perhaps they would grope for him, grope for him, why are they in darkness? Because their sin has separated them from him in his holiness. Okay. If they would grow for him, they might find him. Though he is not far from each of us. All the way through the Bible, God says, including Jesus in the New Testament, says, those who seek me will find me. God makes that promise. Those who seek me will find me. God preached that the people could search for God and know him, but their lack of salvation would prevent them from, in their sinfulness, from coming near to the holy God who remains separate from sin. The issue is neither God's purpose nor his providential care, but is instead fallen man's unwillingness to reach out to the one true living almighty God who loves us. Instead, God, mankind can resort to building idols and worshiping them, things made by their own hands. Pagan idols feel nothing when touched, but God is moved when people reach out to him, even blindly. God has reached back to each and every person who has ever lived, who have reached out to him. God has, turned, has reached out to them through his eternal son, Jesus, who came to earth and paid the price for each and every person's sins, which no person was able to pay. Hence, in John 3.16, Jesus said also to that man, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus with his sin problem and his problem of being hopelessly separated from God and wanted to know how he could find God if, if he couldn't do it through his good works and keeping all of the things of the oral traditions of the Jews, Jesus said to him, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let's go to verse 28. Paul said, for in him, in God, we live and move and exist. As even some of our own poets have said, for we also are his children. We also are God's children. Paul quotes two Greek poets here. Epimenides, Epimenides of Crete, who said, For him we live and move and exist. For God we live and move and exist. Okay, now take it that both of these two Greeks are pagans who believe in uh, multiple idols, okay? The Stoic poet Eretus said, for we are also his offspring. We are also his children, stating that humanity shared in the divine nature of his idol Zeus, but these two things do apply to the one true living God. In their groping in the darkness, 
unable to find God because of their sinfulness that separated them from God. They learned some basic truths about themselves and God. They learned for him we live, move, and exist. And they also learned that we also are his offspring. They learned these two basic truths, okay? But they still weren't quite to the place where they could know God. Paul's point is that all people have an intrinsic understanding of our origins from, from and the total dependence upon a single creator and sustainer. But Paul calls for him the God of the Hebrew Scripture. That is the truth. This is the unknown God that the Greeks do not know, that they've been groping for. God meant for the people to inhabit and manage this magnificent sphere of life called earth. As he says in Genesis 1, 28 through 30 in the Hebrew scriptures. The whole world except the family of one man named Noah turned away from God to follow the evil ways of Satan and the demonic. So God caused a worldwide flood which killed all of mankind except for one family which reached out to the living God whom they knew to be that God of the Bible. The Lord, the Almighty. After the flood subsided, the families of two of Noah's three sons also turned away from God to seek the evil ways of Satan and the demonic. So God chose the lineage of the third son, Shem, through which to bring the Messiah or Christ. Messiah is the Hebrew word for this one that God was going to send. And Christ was the Greek word for this one that God was going to send, which who was is the eternal son of God. Okay. He, Jesus, is God the Father's anointed one for the purpose of paying the price of redemption for all human sins for all time by laying down his life in our place. Why was his death sufficient? Because he lived a sin-free life. Every other one of us humans has lived a life which is full of sin. And we are all separated from God. Jesus is God's son. And he is the only one who could live a holy life on this earth. He came, lived that holy life, and willingly laid down his life as payment for our sins. Okay, let's come to 2 Corinthians 5.21, where we read in our New Covenant Scriptures, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God is a personal and loving God. Now in our lost state of sin, he wants all people to seek him and reach out and this time, find him. But we must do it in the name of that one who is sinless and has paid the price for our sins, Jesus. Now Paul says in verse 29, being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. 
the logical conclusion based on the absolute truth of God's word. Since we are God's offspring, the work, that's how it's translated in Christian Standard Bible, instead of being called the children of God, instead of being translated being then the children of God, Christian Standard Bible says, since we are God's offspring, the work of his hands, that it stands to reason that no idol crafted by human hands is sufficient to represent the divine nature. So now we come down to chapter 17. Paul had thus far made five main points. Number one, the God of the Bible is the creator of all things, all things. Number two, God is the sustainer of all things, living or non living Number three, God is the eternal living being, the original living being that will live forever. Number four, God is the judge of all things. And number five, God is our personal Savior. Okay, now let's go to verses 30 through 31. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Paul's sermon returned to the theme of the Athenian spiritual ignorance. For a, re for a season, God in his patience had overlooked the times of ignorance. The idea was not that God was unaware or treated sin frivolously. He simply delayed judgment. This was much as he had done with the nation of Israel for centuries before sending them into exile. Now the previously unknown God has been revealed. So ignorance no longer provides an excuse. Now with the incarnation of Christ Jesus, God's only son, those who were once ignorant will be held accountable by the holy God. In verse 30, in the wake of Jesus Christ's incarnation, his physical life on earth, his death, and his resurrection, God is now declaring that all people everywhere should repent. The Greek word translated repent is metanoeo, which means to feel remorseful and to desire to change one's sinful way of living. The opportunity for everyone to individually turn or repent from his or her sinful ways and lack of understanding and knowingly believe that his salvation provided only through his son, Jesus, Paul says, has now arrived for all of you. All of you who are in earshot of these words I am saying today. In the case of the Athenians and many other Gentiles, repentance meant ceasing from the worship of the idols that were so strongly woven into their national culture. God Yahweh, Elohim, translated the Lord God, whom they had known previously, was the one that they had to turn to exclusively, and they needed to place their faith in his son, 
Jesus and the price that he paid for their sins. Verse 31, God stated that God has not only appointed a day of judgment, but he has also determined the man who will carry out this reckoning for every single person who has ever lived on this earth. As God the Son, Christ Jesus, Christ also can be translated Messiah, Messiah Jesus, holds the authority to judge the world. As given to him by God. God has furnished proof to all men and validated the work and power of Jesus by raising him from the dead. And Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth announcing this fact. Repentance is a genuine, heartfelt turning from sinful ways through the ways of God toward the ways of God as defined in the Bible. Faith and belief is the genuine lifestyle-changing acceptance of Jesus Christ and a lifelong commitment of the entire personality to him as Lord and Savior. In so doing, the person is willfully choosing to turn from the world's ways and joining God's kingdom. The Greeks understood well the meaning of of great kingdoms from their great kingdom of Alexander the Great extending all the way from Greece to India and from Macedonia in the north through Egypt in the south. Now the kingdom of the empire emperors of Rome ring the entire Mediterranean Sea. They understood this concept. In verse 31, Paul continued to explain that God initiated all things through his creation of the universe, the earth, and the people he has made in his own image. As creator, God holds all authority over nature and humanity to issue his commands. As ruler, he has the right to judge the world in righteousness, and he will do so just He will do this, do so with justice to every person on a day which he is fixed in the future. We will hold each end of, he will hold each individual person, you and me, and every single other person who has ever lived accountable for his or her sins committed in rebellion mine or your personal sins against his holy righteousness in that final day of judgment of every person God's verdict will be marked by complete and undeniable righteousness. For God is holy, totally set apart from sin. Now look at verses 32 through 33. There we go. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. But others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out from their midst. The Epicurean philosophers believed that human existence ceased at death. The Stoics believed that only the, material, the immaterial spirit survived death. Thusly, for all Greeks, the idea of a, bad, a bodily resurrection made no sense. There were some in the audience who began to sneer when Paul spoke of Jesus' resurrection of, of the dead. However, there were others whose interest was piqued when they responded, we shall hear you again concerning this. Paul left the Areopagus and soon thereafter left Athens. 
verse 34, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysus, 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 the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. The good news, though I don't pronounce these names well, God knows them. The good news is that some men joined him and believed along with a woman named Damaris. With the names he mentions here, Luke emphasizes that the gospel of Jesus is for both men and women and for people from every nation of the earth. It also reminds us that other women like Lydia of Philippi in Acts 16.40, as well as Lois and Eunice of Lystra in Acts 16.1-2, through 2, and the important roles of Christian women in the days of the church. Every single one of us is held accountable personally in the same way. We must each stand before God. We must repent of our sins to him and accept the sacrifice made by his son, Jesus, and believe in his resurrection from the dead. And we will be saved. And someday, when we pass from this earth, we will be resurrected just like him. Let's pray. Father, we praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord God, for this great promise of eternal life that you've given to each and every one of us. Lord, to give us hope, an eternal hope, to know that each one of us can live forever with you, Lord, by your power and by your grace and by your love, we can be saved. Lord, we thank you for this great promise that you've given us and the work you've done through your son, Jesus, as you've come to this earth and laid down your perfect sin-free life as payment for my sins and our sins. Thank you, Lord God, for now, as we finish our lives out on this earth, living for you, that you have filled us with your Holy Spirit. And we can hear your voice speak to us. And you guide us in the ways that you would have us to go so we can feel secure and we can feel free and we can live with you and walk with you and all these things that go on in this earth. And we cannot, we have no need to worry for we know that we walk with you, Lord Jesus. We ask all these things, Lord Jesus, in your great name. Amen. It's good to see you guys. Uh, this is a great words, isn't it? We'll see you guys next week. Same time, same place. Bye-bye.